is round two of our E-Church Harvest Revival. And tonight, as promised, a man of God that has an anointing beyond you have ever experienced. Let me share his story with you. He came to America from Liberia, Monrovia, Liberia, with just a suitcase and a fist full of $1 bills. In that time that he came, he went to Oral Roberts University. He became an outstanding student there. He graduated with his MDiv, the number one student in his graduating class. He later went back to school and received and earned his doctorate of ministry. In the time that this man of God came to America and began doing the work of God from Monrovia, Liberia, he has planted 300 churches all over the world. Well, not to overlook the church that he planted in Silver Springs, Maryland, over 2,000 from 45 different countries are represented in his church. He's an outstanding man of God. He's a scholar. He's a lover of God's people. He is anointed to preach and to teach the word of God. Bishop Darlingston Johnson, who is a personal friend of mine, I have a close connection with him because he's the one that brought me to the motherland. We met many years ago. And when I learned that he was from Africa, my heart just raced and sang. And it was my first trip ever to Africa was with him. When I went to Africa to Ivory Coast, Abidjan, to a conference that he had, I always had a love for the motherland. And he helped consummate that love in my heart for the motherland. And since then, we have walked shoulder to shoulder. He first was consecrated bishop, I second, under the fellowship that we both were a part of. Whenever I've gone to Africa with Bishop Johnson, I will tell you what happens. You don't go through regular protocol when you land on the motherland with him. God has so elevated him in the sight of men that they come in and get you like you are a diplomat. They grab your luggage. You don't go through regular customs, though you do go through the legal procedures of entering the country. They are waiting in a motorcade for you to take you to the place that you're going to stay. Sirens are blaring. You rush through the city. You rush to the place that you're going to stay. All because how God has elevated him in the eyes of men that they esteem such reverence to this awesome man of God. I want you to hear this man of God. The depth of teaching, the depth of anointing, the revelation, the insight, but more than that, the life this man leads, devoted. He is now in over 45 nations overall, as I said, that attends his church. But beyond that, there are 150 nations that read his blog, that read his several books that he has read, that he has written, and has connected to him, with him. It's a tremendous man of God. And I want you to hear him tonight. Before you hear the word tonight, I want to give you the opportunity to give. There's many ways you can give. We believe here at New Life that your tithes and your offerings are come to the church that you are a member. I messed that up. Here, 
Here at New Life, we believe that your tithe belongs to the local church. Your offerings, if you're not a member here, can be planted where you are being fed at that time. So we welcome the opportunity for you to plant a seed in this harvest revival. We know this is the time that you're going to be blessed in this harvest month of November. If you are a life changer, oh yes, we expect you to give your tithes, your offerings, and your sacrificial giving. Whatever the case may be, you're going to be blessed when you give as it has been given unto you. Good measure, shaken down, will men give unto your bosom, running over. Get ready to receive the word. After the worship experience, then the word. I'll see you on the other side. Bless the Lord, praise come on. Bless the Lord, oh mighty one, oh mighty one. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord, you heavenly host, come on, raise it. Bless the Lord, hey, bless the Lord, all you his people, all you his people, and let all the earth this morning and let all the earth sing for the praises. Let's do it again, come on. Bless the Lord, you got it down. Bless the Lord, oh mighty one. That's you and I. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, you heavenly host on the first Sunday, church. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, all you His people, and let all the earth sing for the praises. My favorite part. Here comes the invitation. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on and bless him. Come on and praise his name. Come on, come on and bless him. Yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on and bless him. Hallelujah. Come on and praise his name. Come on, Do it again. Come on, come on, come on. Praise his name. Come on and praise his name. Hey. Come on, come on and bless him. It's an invitation. Come on, come on. The Lord, oh mighty one, oh mighty hey, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, the heavenly host, the heavenly host. come on, put a smile on your face, church, bless the Lord, bless, bless the Lord, all you his people, and let all the earth, and let all the earth, sing for the greatest, come on, just the voices, be, come on, bless the Lord, bless the Lord, Again, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, and come on and praise his name. Come on, come on, and come on, raise the music. Yeah, come on, come on. Please, come on, come on. Come on, come on, and bless him. Come on, and praise his name. Come on, come on, and bless him. Come on, come on, and praise his name. Come on, come on, and bless him. Come on, come on, and praise his name. Come on, come on, and bless him. Come on, come on,
thank you. Come on, tell the person that come on. Come on, come on. Tell the person behind you, come on, come on. Oh, oh, oh. Back to the top, B. Bless the Lord, come on. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, the heavenly host, on the first Sunday, bless the Lord, all you his people, and let all the earth, hey, sing for the praises, here comes the invitation again, yeah, come on, come on, hey, Use your hands, sir. Come on, come on. 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 Come on, For the Lord in life, for the Lord in life, showing the new every morning. For the Lord in life, for the Lord in life, showing mercy. When I move my body, when I move my feet, when I open my mouth, then the darkness flees. When I move my body, when I move my feet, hey, what, are you ready? Come on. When I move my body, let's go, y'all. Let 
me hear the hands again, bro. Yeah, yeah. Clap your hands. Well, I'm not shy now. Yes, Lord. I feel something breaking now, Bert. Oh, 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 yeah. Hey. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, come on, y'all. Let's do it again. Yeah. And my dance is a weapon. My shout is a weapon. My clap is a weapon. My clap. Let's go, y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Clap your hands. It's called a Zamar praise. Let the instrument praise them. Let the instrument praise them. Hey. It's called a Zamar praise. Let the instrument praise them. Let the instrument praise them. It's called a Zamar praise. Let the instrument praise them. Save my soul. Made me whole. Save my soul. <laughs> Made me whole. Hey. Save my soul, made me whole. Save my soul. I feel something breaking now, Bert. Oh, 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 yeah. Come on, turn the instruments up back there, Jason. It's just a my praise this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My praise is a weapon. My praise is a weapon. My clap is a weapon. Come on, turn the band up. I feel something breaking now. Turn it up, Jason. Yes, Lord. Let me hit the hand for it again. Let me hit the one B. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him in the morning. Praise him in the new day. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him when the sun goes down. Hey, hey. Praise him. We come to pray. Yeah, you come on. I don't know what you come to do. I don't know what you come to do. I come to clap my. 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 Clap your hands. Let's go, y'all. Yes, Lord. I feel something breaking now. I feel something breaking now. Depression gotta go this morning. Cancer, you gotta go this morning. Cancer, you gotta go, yeah. I don't know what you come to do. I don't know what you come to do. I don't know what you come to do. I come to look at you. I tell her. Shout, 
hallelujah now. I will come up and I will hand all ye people. I shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Oh, just felt something go through here, bruh. Hallelujah to Jesus. Hey. Let's look for it. special time in the life of the church as we celebrate Harvest, Harvest Revival and I count it an honor. Well, hello, New Life. You invited me in. Special spite of the pandemic, you still brother, found a way to bring this house. I, I don't take this lightly and I'm trusting that God will enable me to speak a word that will strengthen uh, the local church as well as the individual members of your congregation. We are all praying for an end to this epidemic, and hopefully soon, and that will permit us once again to be able to travel freely and hopefully be able to embrace one another in the very near future. But again, thank you very much for the invitation. Pastor Chris and I are doing well. Uh, Bethel is doing well, and we, we are sure that New Life is doing well. Also, in Jesus' name, love you guys. Amen. Well, let's let's go to the word. I want us to look at uh, Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12. And I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you, uh, your life. I want to talk to you about knowing and walking in and experiencing the perfect will of God for you. I know that subject concerning God's will is one that is uppermost on a lot of people's minds. And Often we want to know God's will concerning marriage. Uh, who does God want me to marry? Uh, God's will concerning what school I should attend, what career I should pursue, and on and on and on. These very personal, individualistic, uh, individualized uh, revelations of God's will for our lives personally, uh, often is of concern to believers, and, and it's a good thing um, that we would want to know God's will in those areas, and God chooses at times to reveal those things to us in very specific ways, but many times He does not yet. He is able to order our steps into His perfect will, and, and we, we get to discover His will after we're in it. So I would encourage you not to be anxious about these things, but to trust the Lord. But let's look at Romans chapter 12, and we're going to begin at verse 1, because I want to talk to you about God's perfect will, but I'm going to come at it a little bit differently. 
uh, than perhaps you have heard before. And, and so I want you to, to listen because I believe if we, if we catch this revelation, it's going to make a great difference in our lives personally and in the local church. Chapter 12, verse 1 of Romans reads, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you do what? Present your bodies a living sacrifice. And then in verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There it is. There is such a thing as God's perfect will for our lives. And as I indicated earlier, many Christians spend a lot of time trying to discover what that perfect will is. And it's a good thing to want to be led by the Lord when you're choosing a wife or a husband, to be led by the Lord when you're choosing a career, to be led by the Lord when you're making a decision as to where to live. It's, it's a good thing, and thank God that the Holy Spirit is in us, and He can grant us wisdom, and He can guide us in the truth. But I'm concerned, however, that if we take this particular verse regarding God's perfect will, and we apply it in those very individualistic and personal terms, we run the risk of missing what he's actually trying to say to us in this particular chapter. And this is what I want to focus your attention on. I want to focus your attention on what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God as it has been spoken about by the Apostle Paul in this passage. Now, obviously, as we just read, that will does exist. And, and God is not hiding His perfect will for us. He's actually using this chapter to reveal to us what His perfect will is and what we need to do in order to experience that will in our lives. Hallelujah. Now, there are two important principles that we should not overlook because these are critical principles that we need to understand and apply to our lives if we're going to, again, know, walk in, and experience God's perfect will, as Paul is describing it in this chapter. Here's the first principle. Present your bodies, he said, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Don't jump over that, because what Paul is saying here, if I am going to walk in and experience the perfect will of God, it begins by a decision I make to embrace a life of sacrifice and service. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Remember in the next verse, he talks about the perfect will of God, but this is a part of that discussion. And what he's saying here is, if we're going to experience his perfect will, then one of the first things we have to do is make the decision to embrace a life of sacrifice and service to God. A life similar to the life that Jesus lived. Remember Jesus said, that he did not come to do his own will, but to do the will of the Father. And we know no one operated and walked in the perfect will of God more, more perfectly than our Lord Jesus. And he said the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The reason why Jesus was able to operate in the perfect will of God was Jesus made the decision to embrace this life of sacrificial service to God and to people in His name. If we fail to make this foundational commitment to a life of sacrifice and service, we can never experience the perfect will of God. Our decisions will always be warped and our decisions concerning what we will do, how we'll spend our time, 
how we sp use our resources, will all be decisions built on the wrong foundation and consequences those decisions will lead us into error. So hear me, a new life. One of the first things that you need to do as individual members of, of, of the church is to embrace a life of sacrifice and service unto God. Remember, the Bible describing our Lord Jesus said in Philippians that even though he was God, he did not consider equality with God as something he had to hold on to. But he humbled himself and became a servant to the point that he was willing to even give his life. Here is the model before us. Here is the example. Here is the pattern. You see, Jesus could have insisted on his rights, but we're being told he chose not to do so. Instead, he focused or he insisted on fulfilling his responsibilities to God. And because his focus was on fulfilling his responsibilities, he did not insist on his rights. And consequently, he was able to operate in the very perfect will of God. You can't jump over, you cannot jump over that step and still experience God's will. Keep that in mind. Amen. This, here's the second principle, and it's found in uh, the second verse. The second verse says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove, again, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So here's another principle. The first one is, I must embrace this life of sacrifice and service. Instead of insisting on my rights, I need to learn to insist upon fulfilling my responsibilities. And secondly, he's saying here, if I or you or any man or woman who wants to experience God's perfect will would do so, he or she must make this critical decision that you're going to reject, we're going to reject the world's way of thinking. There is a way that the world approaches decisions. There's a way that the world prioritizes what it does that hinders or will prevent you or any man from experiencing God's perfect will for him. We need to know how the world thinks, and then we need to make the decision to reject that mindset and replace it with a, a mind that is like that of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We cannot experience God's will while thinking like the world, while embracing the mindset of the world, while approaching our decisions and establishing our priorities using the same set of lens that the world uses in making their decisions and running their lives. So now the question is, what is specifically Paul referring to when he tells us to reject, not be conformed to the way the world thinks? What exactly am I to be rejecting? What is this mindset? that characterizes the way the world thinks, which if I embrace, will prevent me from walking in and experiencing God's perfect will. Again, the answer is there. Uh, too often we treat verse one and verse two as though they stand alone and they're separate and set apart and are not connected to the verses that follow. That's a mistake. And because we do that, we don't receive the revelation concerning God's perfect will that is in the text. So let me take you one verse further, because verse 3 actually will help us to identify that way of thinking that characterizes the world that we must not allow ourselves to be conformed to. Verse 3 says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, listen to this, not to think of himself more 
highly than he ought to think. There it is. But to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. That's the answer right there. What is Paul saying? Here is how the world thinks. And if you think this way, this is going to prevent you from experiencing God's perfect will. How does the world think? He says, the world thinks more highly of itself than it ought to think. And so what Paul is saying here is, there is a focus on self that is characteristic of a mind that is controlled by the system of the world that makes self the center around which everything revolves. The mindset, this me-centered mindset that places me at the center in which everything, around which everything revolves, would keep me from walking in, knowing and experiencing God's perfect will. The world focus upon itself, and the world makes self the most important person in the room. Pleasing the self becomes the most important motivation and the number one priority as it makes its decision. And Paul is saying, if I or you want to experience the perfect will of God for our lives, we want to walk in the perfect will of God, then we must make this critical decision that we're going to remove self from the center. We cannot allow self to be the primary motivation for our decisions, for the priorities we set. Pleasing self cannot be the greatest motivation for our lives, and yet we experience God's perfect will. Again, think of the master. Not my will, but your will be done. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. That would please me. But I am not as a man, I'm not at the center of the universe. The world doesn't arrive, uh, uh, revolve around me. I'm not the most important person in the room. You are God. And so not my will, but your will be done. And so the problem with the way the world thinks, and this is the thing that we must reject, is that the world thinks more highly of itself than it ought to think. People in the world have an exaggerated opinion of themselves. And as believers who want to walk in, know the very perfect will of God for our lives, we've got to reject this notion that we are the most important person in the room and that everybody in the room exists to meet my needs, to serve me, and uh, pleasing me is the motivation that drives my decisions, establishes my priorities, determines what I will do and not do. You see, being me, being me centered will guarantee that I never experience God's perfect will. We could call that, and you probably have heard this term or used it yourself, approaching life and making decisions setting priorities with a consumer mentality. And that consumer mentality is incompatible with God's perfect will. And so I cannot have a consumer mentality, a consumer mindset, and walk in God's perfect will because God's perfect will is not compatible or consistent with a consumer mentality. And and we know that that's the mentality that permeates our culture. Um, Joseph Hillman, um, in an article in Christianity Today, he, 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 this is what he writes. Let me just read what he said. He said, we are radically, he's talking about the society, we are radically individualistic. We, we're oriented toward personal fulfillment in ways profoundly more me-centered than any other culture or people group in world history. He's literally saying the United States, the culture of the West, particularly the culture in the U.S., is more individualistic, uh, more me-centered than 
any other country in the history of the world. Obviously, that's an opinion, but obviously that opinion must be based on, on, on research. He says, it is our individualism, our insistence that the rights and satisfaction of the individual must take priority over any group to which one belongs. My rights takes priority over the group. And he says, this has seriously compromised our ability, our ability to serve God and to glorify him. And you can see this uh, consumer mentality, this me-centered approach to decisions and to life in, in, in the way uh, the commercials and the tag lines that many uh, businesses uh, use as a way of gr uh, grabbing our attention and motivating us to use their product. For instance, Botox, cosmetics, their tagline is, I did it for me. Ah. For me, McDonald's, you deserve a break today. And Burger King, have it your way. Dove, self-esteem fun, every girl deserves to feel good about himself. And Nike, just do it. If you notice, what are they appealing to? They are appealing to this me-centered uh, philosophy mindset where pleasing me, satisfying me, making me happy, having my way, doing it for me is the thing that motivates me the most to make decisions. Now, this is characteristic of the culture. Unfortunately, the culture, the world system has invaded the church. And as a result, millions, millions of Christians, perhaps the majority of Christians, have embraced this me-centered approach to life and to decision-making and to their involvement in the church. And as a result, they are not experiencing God's perfect will. They too approach the church and their involvement in the church with this consumer mentality. And so some come to the church and they, they treat the church like a gas station where I come in maybe once a week, if that often, but whenever I feel my spiritual energy is low, I come in, like I pull up to a gas station in order to get something, some spiritual energy, some fuel that hopefully would get me going or keep me going for a week or two. That approach, this is purely consumerism. I approach a church in order to get some spiritual energy that hopefully can sustain me. Or they approach the church and they see the church as a drugstore, a pharmacy where I come to fill a prescription to help me manage my pain. And so when they come, what do you have that can help me manage my pain, my emotional pain, my psychological pain, my spiritual pain? They come, again, the church is a pharmacy where you come, you purchase or you obtain what you want, and then you leave. That's a consumer approach. Again, that's that me-centered approach that's impacting and influencing the decisions you're making regarding the church. Some see the church as a theater where, you know what, I just need a, a mental break. I need a, to take a break. And, and to relax them. And so they come to church just to get some things off their mind and to be spiritually entertained, not to be transformed, just to be entertained. Consumerism, affecting the decisions you're making and the way they relate to the church. And that very consumer mentality in their approach to the church is keeping them out of God's will. You will never experience God's will, perfect will for your life, if that's how you see Christianity and if that's how you relate to the church as a consumer. Hmm? Some of us see the church as a big box store like Walmart where you go and, and you, you, know, you want a one-stop shop where you can find everything you need on this aisle, I can get this, on that aisle, I can get this, on this aisle, I can get that. And so we come to a church and the church for us is like a big box store and I come with all of these needs and want to make sure you have something. Do you have, what do you have for my children? What do you have for the young ones? What do you have for the youth? Uh, what do you have for me? What do you have for marriage? What do you have for finances? And basically, it's a one-stop shop and you've come to see what's there that you can consume. And it's always about me. This consumer mentality is about what's in it for me. It's about what can you give me? How can you serve me? How can you meet my needs? That attitude will keep you and me out of 
God's perfect will. You see, a person with a consumer mentality makes it all about himself and knows nothing about loyalty. Consumers aren't loyal to a business, they're loyal to themselves. And so, unfortunately, we have this, this pandemic of, of, of disloyalty that uh, permeates, uh, uh, sadly, the body of Christ, where individual members are unwilling to commit themselves uh, to a local church and to come with an attitude that Christ has demonstrated for us, approaching the local church with a, with, with, with a mindset to serve and to serve sacrificially the mission and the glory of God in that local church. And for that very reason, we're missing God's perfect will. You see, when you view the church as a consumer, then the church simply becomes a means to an end. Uh, and the consumer is loyal to nobody but to himself. Uh, and so these, 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 these folks want to be free to shop around, to come when they want to, to get involved when they want to, to pick and choose. And uh, the idea of making a real commitment. So on Sunday morning, Frank decides, ah, I'm not going to go to church today, I'm just going to stay home. Uh, on Tuesday night, uh, Evelyn decides, ah, the church is meeting for choir, we heard some part of the choir, but uh, I'm too tired, I'm not going to go. Um, John, who's a part of, a, of the men's group, the men agreed that they were going to help a member move, and the email was sent out on Friday to remind him, and John just says, uh, I, you know, I'm loyal to the men's group, but you know what, uh, I don't want to be too committed, because I don't want to be, I want to be free to basically do what I want to do when I want to do it, and so he just chooses to ignore the email and sleep in on, on Saturday. All of those are symptoms and examples of people who are approaching the church or Christianity with a me-centered, individualistic mindset characteristic of the world, where they see the church of the body of Christ as existing to serve them. They are at the center, and their Christianity is primarily in their mind between God and them. And they fail to realize, and listen to me, they fail to realize that God has not just called you or called them to himself. God has equally called us to one another. The, 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 the commandment, the great commandment is love God with all your heart. The second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. And so God has not just called us to himself. He has called us to one another. And if we are going to walk in and experience the perfect will of God, we've got to understand that foundational truth. There is no such thing as a Christian who is not a member of the body of Christ. God adds no one to the body who he doesn't save, but God saves no one who he doesn't add. And immediately, when you receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, God placed you into the body of Christ. And he didn't place you there to be served. He didn't place you there to be furniture. He placed you there to be a member of that body. And he gifted you because his perfect will for you, listen to me, his perfect will for you, and this is what Paul is talking about here, his perfect will for you is that you will embrace the revelation that now you are a member of Christ's body and you have been gifted and you are to use the gifts he's given you, the time, the talent, and the treasure in sacrificial service unto God within the context of the body that he's made you a part of. Hallelujah. If we miss that, if we fail to see that we are saved and we are gifted by God and we are placed within the body and God's perfect will, as Paul is really des de describing it here, is here, is that you recognize that you have been made a part of the body. You've been joined to the body. And that local church that you are a part of, God's 
perfect will for you will only be experienced when you recognize that the time and talents and treasure that God has given you have been given to you to be used in sacrificial service unto him within the context of that body for the building up of that body. Hear me, God is glorified by individuals. Yes, but God saves his greatest glory and God is most glorified by the body of Christ functioning together with each member using his or her gifts for the good of the body. You are thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think when you think that the body exists to meet your needs, when in truth you were created to meet its needs. You are thinking more highly of yourself than you ought to think and therefore cannot experience God's perfect will. If you think that you can fulfill your purpose, God's will for you, that God has a special plan for your life that you can fulfill with or, with or without his body, that you don't need the body that you're a part of, that local church, in order to walk in and do God's will. If you think you and God alone are sufficient to fulfill God's will and the body of Christ is only incidental, you are thinking of yourself more highly than you ought to think, and you are missing God's perfect will for your life. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Look at verses 4 and 5. Again, don't read this chapter as though verses 4 and 5 have nothing to do with verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3. No, Paul is elaborating on what God's perfect will is. This is God's perfect will. He's describing now what God's perfect will. And he's just told you, in order to experience God's perfect will, you need to reject this me-centered. Uh, secondly, you need to commit yourself, embrace yourself, embrace this revelation that you are going to live a sacrificial life of service to God. And now he's about to show you the context in which that sacrificial life and service is to be rendered. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all the members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And everyone members of one another. Verse 6, having been gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us with a prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Ministry, let us wait on our ministering. All of this, and we, you can read, he that exhorted, he begins to list all of these gifts that we have received, and notice he's describing what God's perfect will is. And God's perfect will is that every one of us recognize that we are in the body of Christ, and we are all members one to, one to another, we're joined together, and each of us has been gifted, and God's perfect will, God's good and acceptable and perfect will for every believer is the same in this regard, that he expects every single believer, and that includes every member of the body of Christ that is at uh, New Life, that you would understand that God has placed you in that body, and his perfect will is for you not to be a spectator, not to be furniture, not to be me-centered, not to think that that body exists to serve you, but you realize God has put me here and gifted me. And God's perfect will is that I sacrificially serve him by using my gifts of time, talent, and treasure to build up and to strengthen this body that I'm a part of. Hallelujah. And so he begins to give us the things and exhort us don't just be furniture. Don't act as though the body exists to serve you. Don't make yourself more important than the body. Yes, you are important as an individual, but you're not more important than the body. Yes, the body will meet your need, but the reason you were created was not so the body can meet your need. The reason you were created and saved was so you can be an instrument to meet the need of the body, so that the body, as the body, the local church grows with a growth that comes from God. Now, think about it. Just use the analogy because God is using the analogy of the physical body to help us understand what he's talking about. Each of us 
individually has a spe specific purpose and assignment. But our assignment and our purpose and God's perfect will for us is connected to the role that God would have us to play within the body that he's put us in for the purpose of building that body. If we don't understand the purpose, then we'll never discover his will. So look at the analogy and let's, let's, let's use our physical body as a purpose, as, the, I mean, as, as, a, as an object lesson. My arm, which I'm using right now, can only fulfill its purpose by being part and connected to this body. And it has to be fully connected to fulfill its purpose. If it simply was hanging on or loosely connected, it would be a source of pain for the body. It'll be a source of problem. It'll become a liability if it was simply hanging on. It certainly can't fulfill its purpose at all if it's disconnected. But even if it's connected, but just loosely connected, it becomes a problem, a source of pain rather than the, than the answer or the solution. God didn't save you and put you in the body here, new life, so that you can simply hang on and be loosely connected. No, you'll never know God's perfect will that way. God's perfect will is for you to be fully co committed, fully connected, and begin to use the gifts and talents that God has given you for the building up of that body. The eyes. The, the body does not exist for the eyes. The eyes were created and placed in the body for the sake of the body. The eyes were created so the body can see. The, the eyes were not created so the eyes can see. The eyes were created so the body can see. My legs were not created so the legs can walk. My legs were created so my body will be able to walk. Even so, every single one of us who he has saved, he gives. And then he places us in a body and his perfect will, and this is what Paul is talking about, is that each of us then understand that God wants us to sacrificially serve the mission and the glory of God in that church, using our gifts of time, talent, and treasure to build up that body. And you're, you're thinking more highly of yourself. You are not going to experience God's will if you think that the body exists to serve you. And so when you show up in the room or when you show up at church, it's supposed to be about people serving you. It's supposed to be about them attending to you and attending to your children, attending to your, your marriage. And you don't understand that God's perfect will for you as a child of God is that you will recognize that he has gifted you, given you time, talent, and treasure. He has placed you in that local body and you'll experience his perfect will as you commit to one, embracing this life of sacrificial service that Jesus himself modeled for us and rejecting this, this worldly mindset that makes you the center around which everything should resolve, revolve and makes you more important than the body you're part of. Now, each member is important, but think about it. My body will do everything it can to save my arm, but if it becomes clear that the arm, I have to make a choice between the arm and the body, the arm will be sacrificed because the body is more important than my arm. Even so, each of us is extremely important to God. Christ died for all of us. But hear me, Jesus is gonna be presenting to himself the church, not individual members, separate and independent, but he's gonna be presenting to himself the church, that is the body. Of Christ. He's going to be presenting it to himself as his bride. Individually, no member is the bride. We only become the bride of Christ as we function and as we belong to his one body over which he is the head. You want to walk in God's perfect will? You want to experience God's perfect will? Well, this is what Paul is saying. The perfect will of God is for you to recognize that when he saved you, he gifted you, he blessed you with time and talent and treasure. And he has called you and positioned you in the body of Christ so that you can sacrificially serve him by serving that body with your gifts of time, talent, and treasure. That you not just be loosely attached where you become a source of pain and problem and 
you, you handicap uh, the body, but then you fully commit yourself with all of your gifts and times and talents. And say to the Lord, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Lord, use me even here in this local church to build up this local body, this body of Christ, in the name of Jesus. You know, the Apostle Paul, uh, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 11, if I'm not mistaken, he was dealing with the subject of, of the body of Christ and, and the whole communion piece. And he, and he said to them, he said, listen, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you have died prematurely. And he said, the reason is you didn't discern the body of Christ. Hear me, that's very serious. He's saying, in essence, he said, you didn't understand the nature of the body. And you did not understand how to function in this body. Because if you understood the mystical body of Christ, and you understood that you were placed in that body, and you functioned the way you should be functioning, using your time, your gifts, and your talents to build up that body, some of you who have died will still be alive. Some of you who are weak will be strong. And, and because by not functioning as God designed you to function, you are not fully taking advantage of the grace of God that would be available and would be able to flow through you to each other. If you were to get up tomorrow or tomorrow night, and you would come home and, and you click the, the, your... your you switch on for your lights and no, nothing happened and you turn your radio on and nothing happened. You try to turn your TV on, nothing happened. You would be concerned. But if you looked across the street and you saw your neighbors and all your neighbors had their lights on and, 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 and everything seemed to be working at your neighbors, but your lights couldn't come on, your TV wasn't working, your refrigerator wasn't working, you would conclude that there was not a shortage of power you will conclude there must be something broken. There must be a, some broken wires or some broken connections, broken connections in my house that is preventing the flow of power that's available from getting to my appliances. And then you would make it a priority to find those broken connections and fix them because the problem is not that power isn't available. The problem is the power that's available is not getting to the appliances because of broken connections. And, and here, I mean, this is what's happening in the body of Christ, and this is what's happening in many of our local churches. There's more than enough power in our local churches to bring maximum glory to God. We should be seeing more miracles, more answers to prayer, more salvations, more deliverance than we're currently seeing in our churches. And I submit to you, it's not a shortage of power, but the problem is these broken connections that we allow to exist in our, in our houses of worship. And it's because members don't understand the nature and we haven't discerned that the body of Christ is one body and that we are members one of another and that we are supposed to be working together, endeavoring to maintain the unity of the spirit, each of us contributing what God has given us to see the mission and the glory of God accomplished in that church. These broken connections have to be fixed and we need to take our places and change our way of thinking and our attitude towards the local church and realizes that we've got to start prioritizing what God prioritizes. And instead of being focused on this individualistic, personal knowledge of what God's will is for me in terms of who I'm supposed to marry, what am I supposed to do as a career, we ought to be welcoming, embracing this revelation. I, I know the perfect will of God for me is that I fully engage with the body of Christ, the local church, which is the expression of that body. And that I am to be using my gifts and praying that God will use me more and more in a sacrificial way to serve the members of that body with the result that we all grow and we keep growing until Jesus comes. Now, if you want the best example of what I'm talking about, of course, we'll always look to Jesus. And I want to take you back. I want to take you back to the Trinity because that's the primal community. That's the first community. And remember, God has created us in His image, and He really wants us to function the way the Trinity functions. There are three distinct persons, yet they're, they're one. And they serve one another. And they sacrifice, if I may use that word, on behalf of each other. They prioritize the, the will of the community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, over their personal wills or personal welfare. That's what we see happening when Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. He was prioritizing the community, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit over himself. 
And one day we know God said to the son, I need you to go and I need you to sacrifice and I need you to die. And if the son of God uh, was like some of us, he would have responded, you know, I've joined the Trinity. I'm willing to do my part, but why should I be the one to have to do all of that? Why should I be the one to have to become a man? Why should I be the one to have to die? Why should I be the one to have to, to become sin? That's not fair. Or why should I be the one to have to leave the comfort of heaven to go and spend 33 years in that miserable place that is polluted by sin? He could have responded like too often we respond. But because Jesus Christ was not me-centered, he was God-centered, and because he understood the importance of the group, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the, the welfare of that group, the well-being, the purpose of that group, was placed over his personal preferences or desires. He's the example. And consequently, he could say on the cross, it is finished. He did operate in the perfect will of God. Brothers and sisters at New Life, we're talking about a harvest revival. And I'm telling you, this is where the revival begins. It begins with a change of mindset, a change of attitude towards the local church that you're part of. It begins with embracing this revelation concerning God's perfect will. It begins by recognizing that God's perfect will for your life can never be experienced apart from your connection to and involvement in your local church, which is the body of Christ. Every eye needs a body to be an eye. Every ear needs the body to be an ear. Every mouth needs a body to fulfill its purpose. And you and I absolutely need the local church and our connections and our involvement in the local church to fulfill our unique purpose. May God grant you and grant me the grace to embrace this revelation and to walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus, now you know what God's perfect will is for you. Now you know that God's perfect will is inextricably tied to your involvement and support and the use of your time, gifts, and talents to build up his body. Now you know God's will requires that you do not make yourself the center of the universe, the center of the church, the center of the room, and people exist to serve you. No, now you know. That is about you identifying your gifts and using your time, your talent, and treasure by God's help and with God's power to build up His body, the church. And when you are fulfilling that assignment by the power and by the grace that God is giving you, you are walking in, you are experiencing, you are doing the perfect will of God. In Jesus' name, let it be so, I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Love you. Thank you, Bishop Dudley and Lady Dudley, for the privilege. Amen. I told you you were going to be blessed. Didn't I tell you he was going to, didn't I tell you God was going to use him? Now, how are you going to respond to that? What are you going to do? I think you can connect with this church just simply by texting the word decision to 71441. Text the word decision to 71441. If you still want to plan into this ministry, if you want to plan into this man of God who has blessed you with the word, you have the opportunity as well. This is a powerful month of Harvest Revival, special edition E-Church. I'll see you next Wednesday with more Harvest Revival with another powerful speaker. God bless you. Life Changers, before you close eChurch, don't forget to give your tithes, offering, and generosity matching. There are multiple ways to give. May God bless you and thank you for being a part of eChurch. Join us next week at 7 p.m. for a word from Dr. Jazz. Also, our e-comedy event, Thanksgiving Eve, November 25th, 
Rod of God Comedy at 7 p.m. I told you you were going to be...